we arrived in Soap Lake April 24th, 1938. Mm -hmm. tell, tell us how old you were. I was 11 years old. So what were your first impressions as an 11-year-old boy? My God, where did they send us? <laughs> <laughs> well, coming from Los Angeles in, the, in that area, San Diego, Compton actually is where, where we lived when we moved up here. The that I met when we got here, his name was Norman Sundstrom. And I thought to myself, who is this guy, you know? But it was uh, quite a shock. Talk about cultural shock. I was the kid from the big city with the pointed shoes. Well, of course, there was the, the school bully, and the, anybody who was new to the school had to be confronted by this, by this young man. And I took my turn, got the crap beat out of me, because I was from the big city, and you know, kind of an oddity, you might say. What brought your family up here? Well, my grandfather, who built the hotel originally, came down with uh, arthritis, and he and my grandmother came to Southern California where we lived because it was warm and it made him feel better. And he convinced my dad to give up a, a uh, business opportunity with a, a, a music school in, in the area to come up and take over the hotel for a short while while until my grandfather could recuperate. And a month after we got here, my grandfather died and we have been here ever since. Sounds like my story. <laughs> Uh, here's a picture of the hotel Julian was referring to. I'll pass that around. Would you talk a little bit about why your grandfather came here, what his story is in relationship to that hotel, and how he built that hotel, and the whole story on that? Yes. Um, my grandfather was a successful businessman in Russia at the time, 1916. The Bolsheviks, in their wisdom, began killing Jews, and it was called the pogrom. He could see what was happening and decided to get, get out of there as soon as he could. So he took my dad out of, the, out of school. My dad at that time was in the Moscow Conservatory of Music in Moscow, Russia. Then without any money, no passports, just escaped, you might say, up through Siberia, down through Japan to Yokohama, where they caught a ship called the Hawaii Maru, which took them to San Francisco. And my father, my grandfather, being a successful businessman, ultimately became a pushcart merchant, you might say, with selling vegetables and fruit. Uh, how he got to Seattle, I'm not quite sure, but they wound up in Seattle. My dad was 16 years old at the time, entered in the school in, in the first grade because he couldn't speak a word of English. and. Uh, Ultimately, my grandmother and, and my dad's two brothers were being hidden in Russia by sympathizers. And uh, because they were, my grandfather and my dad were from Europe, they were acquainted with spas that they had in Eastern Europe. And dad, my grandfather heard about Soap Lake and the medicinal qualities of the water and ultimately bought a piece of ground and commenced building the hotel, casting every concrete block himself, bring, buying lumber in Cleelum, and bringing it to Soap Lake over the old, old Vantage Highway in an old chain drive Ford truck, built the hotel, and opened it up for business, obviously. In 1927, he bought the old Johnson Hotel, which is stood where the Chevron Station is now here in town, ultimately applied for a permit to move it. They denied the permit, well, he moved it anyway. Gouged up seven miles of highway and ultimately rebuilt that seven miles of highway. Joined it to the part that he had built himself and that became then the Lewis Hotel. How many rooms were in that? 26. 26? Total. Total. There were eight rooms in the old part and 18 rooms in the new, in the new part. Now, well, did it have a dining area and a the dining room? The dining area was in the old part, in the, the old part, part that my grandfather built. Oh, and who did all the cooking? My grandmother. Oh my. <laughs> so in the summer she was really busy. She, yeah, well that's that was the, the thing. They they had to make a year's wages in three months because they had no heat in the building in that time. So they would just button it up and and endure for seven or eight months until it got warm again. 
1945, a plumber by the name of Pete Benville contacted my dad and because of the war was on, was not able to get the prime material, but they installed a, a steam system. At that point then the hotel was open the year round. Oh. That was after my folks had it, of course. Okay. And now, when did your folks take it over from? 1938. 1938. After my grandfather died. Oh, okay, that's right. I'm sorry. Where did your grandparents live during the winter time? In the hotel. Even though there was no heat? Well, they had probably pot belly stoves, enough to keep warm and keep the water running so it didn't freeze. Uh, I'm going to pass around a few photos of, of that hotel uh, just for you to look at before, these the first ones are before the add-on from the Johnson Hotel, but um, would you talk about the, uh, and another one I'm going to pass around has the Sunset Theater next to it, would you mm -hmm. talk about the Sunset Theater and share, share the stories of, you know, if you know anything, who built it, or what, what, you know. I'm trying to think of the name of the fellow that, uh, that owned it, but it was uh, the theater, there wasn't even one in Efrata at the time, the, the one that was built in Efrata was the old Marjo, which is, not there anymore. And then, of course, the Lee Theater came in after that. What year do you think this Sunset Theater was built? It was there when we came in '38, so obviously it was prior to that time. Uh, of course, of course, it was quite quite convenient for us kids to slip over next door and go to the show. Uh, did you pay to go in, or did you sneak in like a lot of people? Well, a little of both. A little of both. <laughs> About what, how much? Was the price of a ticket? Probably five cents. Okay. I can remember one time when we were eating crab. I, I, I don't know where the crab came from, but it, you know how crab smells when it gets a little bit old. So we went to the show and took the crab with us, and we cleaned out three rows of seats. <laughs> uh, who's, who's, who's we? My sister and brother and I. Uh, okay. <laughs> what was your favorite movie? Oh gosh, Linda, I can't remember that far back, to tell you the truth. I imagine a western of some sort would be my favorite movie. Uh, this, this photo I'll pass around. This is probably one of my favorite Soplake photos of, of all the, of all the I, don't, I don't know what it is, but it shows the Sunset Theater, and it shows the Lewis Hotel, and then it shows the intermediate part. That your, your dad must have built the intermediate part. Or did your grandfather build that too? No, you mean between the two yeah. buildings? No, John Lee did. Oh, okay. And then there's the addition. It's kind of neat because you can see the lake in the in the distance. I just didn't, I don't know. It's just a, it really places the old buildings. Um, and then this photo, maybe pass this to Julian right away because I want him to identify who's in that photo. And I don't, you can't see it probably from over here. I don't like it. That's my grandfather and my grandmother, and that's the dining room that you asked about. Oh, really? Oh, great. About how much was the price of a room? At this point, I don't really know, but I know that at, at one point we were renting rooms in the hotel park for $8 a night. Okay, and a meal would cost, or did was that part of? No, the meal would probably be extra. I imagine a dollar, a dollar and a half for a meal. I mean, that, a meal. Yes. Probably five or six courses. Mm. And speaking of meals, this, this particular sign on the hotel says, good meals. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> and you can see there's a pot belly stove in the corner, which is probably how they kept warm during the winter time. When did your grandfather arrive and so forth? Like that was? My grandfather? Yeah. He built the hotel in 1919. So he left Russia in 1916. 1916. About yes. Three years or so to. Wind that, up that's there. about right because they had to. He had to accumulate enough money to not only buy the land but also to pay for the building materials and that type of thing. Did he go to Los Angeles and then come up here or? No, he came to San Francisco. Is where they came in. Okay. Actually, our name when when they arrived in San Francisco was Agronovich, but the people in customs couldn't spell it, so they changed it to Agronov. <laughs> Ever think about going back? Me? Yeah. Agronovich? No, uh, but you know, it was spelled O apostrophe G R A N O V I T C H. 
And Dad used to say, I don't know whether he was joking or whether it was actually true, that there was an Irish general <laughs> that escaped Ireland and moved to Russia, and so I could be part Irish. I don't know. <laughs> How did your grandmother and the rest of the family uh, get to the United States? Well, after a couple of years or so, my dad and my, or actually my grandfather, had accumulated enough money to send for them. But I don't think that was until they moved, actually moved to Seattle. And again, I don't know how they got to Seattle or what prompted them, but it was kind of ironic. Uh, a number of years ago, you all know Joe Malaspino. He had a cousin living in Wenatchee who uh, was also an immigrant. And uh, this young, this, well, he wasn't a young man, but this man had psoriasis that used to come to Soap Lake because of the water. And uh, Morris Cicchetti was his name. He had a shoe shop in Wenatchee. Some, some of you may have known him in the past. Anyway, one time Joe Morris was staying at a motel in Soap Lake. And Joe and I went out to, to see Morris. I, did, I had never met him, but Joe wanted me to meet him. And when he heard my name, Agronoff, he actually started crying. He burst out into tears. Come to find out, when my, grand, when my dad got to Seattle and was put in the first grade, Morris, who had already been here in the United States, was put in charge of my dad because both of them were immigrants. And this was the first time he'd heard my dad's name from the time he was in the first, in first grade until the time that he met me. So that would have been a lot of years. He told me some stories about them stealing peaches off the trees on the way to school and <laughs> things like that. Okay, Dad, tell him the story about how Grandpa got here on the train. Oh, what they oh. did. What your dad did? My dad was a graduate of the Moscow, Moscow Conservatory of Music, and as, a, as such, he wore a, a uniform with lots of braid, gold braid on it. And when they escaped from Russia, my grandfather told my dad to wear his uniform because he emulated that of a, of a general or an officer in the Russian army. And that every periodically the train, train would be stopped and they would check papers. Well, there was very crude bunks in these railroad cars, and my dad and my grandfather were in an upper bunk, and my dad was on the outside where he could hang his arm over the side and they could see the gold braid. At one point, dad tells me they, they were stopped and the Russian guards came on board looking for papers. And my grandfather told my dad, hang your arm over the side, they won't bother you because they see the gold braid and they think you're an officer. Sure enough, they came in and they started tugging on my dad's arm and my grandfather said, don't bother him, he's drunk, he, he doesn't know anything, he's asleep. And they went on. So at that point, they were, you might say, home free. Oh my. That'd be a scary trip. Where are these yes. right here? Yeah. That. This building? No, this. Right here, they. Oh, that's the old Soap Lake water. Uh, Plant. Well, they used to take water and evaporate it out and make the soap lake salts That's what and, I was and soap and oil and that type of thing. The foundations are still there. Oh yes, yeah, so it burnt down a long time ago. And this was this was a dance hall right here. Yeah. Oh, oh, sure. oh, go ahead. This was a dance hall right here. It's over close to where uh, the Zimmer apartment was. Right, right. right, this was before the Zimmer apartments were built closer to the lake in that picture. Yeah. Yes. yeah. And then uh, the building in front where the old V store used to be isn't would there be yet. That would, would be over here, Olson's place. Mm -hmm. Olson's was, it's, oh, Olson's it was closer right on that corner, yeah. Right. Amazing. And then that's the salt plant down yes, there? Yes, yes. Where, um, that's where Mackey's used to live. Mackey's live now. No, no, no. Or close Just to where. Just where I go down, down the hill now. Toward, the, toward West Beach. Uh huh. It's right there. The foundation's still there. Mm. Oh, okay. So, Julian, that means there was two salt factories. There, Roxy's, and, and then the Thorson's, and then this one. Yes. Oh, okay. I Do saw you, that one. Do you know who ran that uh, salt factory there? No, I can't, I, I can't remember who it was. No. Okay. Of course, in those days, I could care less. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you were that young, who? Do you remember when Ole Olson and Blanche moved to Soap Lake? It would have been probably 
42, 43, I'm thinking. And they, they, but before they moved in there, there used to be the Soap Lake reporter or the newspaper. Archie Waddington used to own that. That was before Mr. Sid Jackson had the Soap Lake reporter? Yes. In fact, I think Sid bought it from Archie. Who, 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 this is a picture I'll pass around a second, but who is Pat O'Brien? Pat O'Brien used to be county clerk. Around the state of <laughs> and he owned some cabins. He and his wife owned some cabins right near where the folks' hotel was. Was he uh, an in-law to Arvin's? No, no. That was uh, the county treasurer was married to an Arvin. Okay. Catherine Arvin. This is another really cool photo. And this shows, um, and I have a question on this photo. It's looking up the street. Um, towards, you know, from May, on Main Street looking up, and it, and, it, and it says Lewis Hotel on the top, but across the building is printed, and this wasn't in earlier pictures, Agronoff's. And then, so I want you to talk about that, and then uh, also the Sunset Theater is now in this picture, the Lake Theater, and the film showing there is the story of Molly Kay and the daring Carl's Caballero. The Daring Caballero. Anyway, talk about the Agronoff. How, why was it Agronoff got painted on the side of the building? Well, after, let me, let me back up a little bit. Soap Lake, of course, was quite a, uh, a recreational area for people from the coast because of the medicinal waters and the hot sun and the green mud. And uh, right after the war, it was just, it wasn't fashionable to go to Soap Lake anymore. It was easier to go jump on a plane and fly to Hawaii or to go to Europe and so on. And so the folks uh, didn't actually abandon the hotel concept, but Dad put in a music store and ran that for a few years, and then that was kind of fizzled out. So that's when they decided to go to a Chinese restaurant. And that's why Agronos became a Chinese restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I know this story. It's, I know this story from before, but I didn't realize then it wasn't a hotel then by the it, time. Oh, it, yes, it was still okay, a hotel. Okay. It was still a hotel because there were still da some diehard people that would come over from Seattle to soak up the sun and the water. But not like it used to be at that point. There were people who would come over there religiously every year. You could just about count on them. Matter of fact, they would make their reservation a year ahead of time because if you didn't have a reservation at one point, you didn't have a place to stay. We had them sleeping in bathtubs and on the back porch and <laughs> the whole nine yards. Because they were, and one thing I will say about the people in Soap Lake at the time, if you own cabins or a hotel, you became part of the community in, in that if, if you didn't have a vacancy, you began calling around to your friends who, who did have, and you found a place for them to stay. I think a little of that still exists in Soap Lake. I know that uh, Dick, who owns uh, Dale Thorson's, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I've, he I've heard Carmen do the same thing because if they're full up, they'll call one of the other two large right. hotels. And I can remember in Soap Lake on a Saturday night, you could not walk off, you could not walk down the street or the sidewalk, elbow to elbow. It was just like a steady stream of people walking back and forth, you know, visiting and looking in the shop windows and so on. Tell them about the Chinese restaurant, you know, the cook. Oh, the cook was named Louis Woon, Chinese man. It brought him in from Seattle to do the cooking, oh, boy. and he would. <laughs> we had to walk about the size of this table that he did his cooking with and, and he always had a cigarette in his, in his mouth and the ashes would fall in there and he'd be <coughs> scooping around. You know. But uh, it was quite, a, it was the only Chinese restaurant in Grand County at the time and we had a lot of people that would come there. I hated Saturday night, absolutely hated Saturday night because people would get looped and they'd come in around midnight to eat and bad news. And you waited on tables. I waited on tables, I washed dishes, I did the whole nine yards. Well, all of us did actually. The three three kids, my sister and brother and I. Mother did the the part of the cooking or the preparing of the of the vegetables and so on. And Louis would be in there, <laughs> ashes dropping off. 
Uh, okay, Julian, would you um, kind of describe? I mean, you did you've done this a little bit already, but to talk more about downtown. What? Just kind of maybe, if you want to close your eyes, that's fine. Just just visualize leaving the hotel and walking down Main Street towards what we now know as Highway 17. What you would see on either side of you. If you know a store owner's name, name their name. Just tell us this whole journey down Main Street. Well, of course, if you cross the street directly from the hotel, on the south side would be the telephone company owned by Clausens, Mr. and Mrs. Clausen. And then next to them was the old city jail, which was about the size of this room. And uh, a meat market was the next place. And then the fire station was right there, too, which was at the top of the hill. And there again, at the top of the hill was the pole with a siren on top of it. And that was the, just like it used to be here in Ephrata, if there was a fire in town, the siren would go off and all the volunteers would congregate at the fire station. But that was kind of the dividing point. Everything was east and west. If the east part got new sidewalks, the west side better get them or else, kind of thing, you know. Then there was kind of a vacant lot and another sanitarium. My buddy Leo Hanley used to live there. And then, uh, I can't remember what the next building was. I think it was. I, mean, I can't remember, but then beyond that was the old Lakeside Hotel. Uh, uh, Charlie Malin owned that, and, and uh, then there was a little shop, which ultimately became uh, Shalau's Grocery Store. Incidentally, when we were kids, we would go down the street on railroad roller skates, and Mr. Shalau used to have the produce out there on display, and we would grab something as we went by, and he'd come out there and shake his <laughs> fist at us. And then there was um, the James Cafe and Tavern on the right hand side. And the old, uh, there was a, another kind of a hotel made out of rocks, similar to what's out here. The Coberly? Coberly's, yes. Uh, Mary Coberly's place. Mm -hmm. And uh, then on the corner was. Uh, by this time you're down in the middle of town. On the on the uh, right hand side was another grocery owned by uh, Sophie Toomey. I don't know if you remember her, Linda, or not, but she was kind of a wild character. <laughs> and then there was a drugstore on the corner owned by Walt Goodwin. Mm -hmm. And then Myra's dress shop. When was the Dew Drop Inn open? There was a, next was, to my residence. That was, uh, I'm trying to think of the, uh, I, when was it open? Yeah, when, when, when was it, what, was it next door to Myra's? And no, it was further down, further down the street. On the right hand side, it was the Dew Drop Inn was, uh, was it a hotel too? Or? No, no, it was kind of like a general store. Oh, okay. And in the back was an ice house. They used to, in the wintertime, they would go out to Blue Lake and cut big blocks of ice and bring them into town and store them in this building with sawdust. It was the coolest place in town. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> Literally. That must be right behind where Dwayne has his. Yes, in that, right in that, in that area. Yeah. Right. Who owned the Dew Drop Inn? I'm trying to think of the name. I can't remember. I know that he had a hair lip. <laughs> he talked through his nose. <laughs> but I can't think of his name. Isn't that uh, weird? That's all right. Keep walking down the street, though. Is there any more on the right-hand side, then? No, the dude drop in is probably where about the Shell Station sits right now, in that general vicinity. Oh, on the left-hand side, if you were to go back up the street, was the Bob White Cafe and tavern. And when we were kids in the summertime we'd go and dance at this at the tavern, get kicked out every Saturday night. And the next Saturday night we'd be back dancing. <laughs> and then there was a, a kind of a, a, a souvenir shop with a bowling alley, duck pins bowling alley. 
Was uh, that Tommy's newsstand at that time, or did that come later? I can't even remember the name of the person, but I know they paid us so much a line to set pins, and you had to be very quick. <laughs> That's where the liquor store is now? Yes, I think so, in that area. Uh, the newsstand was in that area too. I've seen a picture. Vickery had that, I think. Mm -hmm. Vickery and Dale Vickery. Okay, and then after the newsstand, which would have been the li where the liquor store is now too. Next to that is the Shrag. Shrag's uh, massage place. And it's been there since the forties or. Oh yes. Oh yeah. Uh, Lauren Schrag uh -huh. had that. And then uh, proceeding up the street, there was uh, Gambriel's place, but that, but that was in later later on. That's where Bridget's at now. Okay. He opened that in 55, but it was Carl's Cozy Cafe um, before then. That Carl, uh, Case. uh, Myra Kaysen's, uh, my husband, Carl. Carl Kaysen, and there was kind of like a, an outdoor dining area in that area, mm -hmm. which is now the Don's. the Opera House for Don's. It was built on that piece of property. And on the corner was a tavern, and then there was the New Beach Hotel across the street, which ultimately burned. And uh, it wasn't too much from there on, except uh, a restaurant that was owned by... Uh, <clears throat> Karras, Harry Karras, K-A-R-A-S, owned that place. And uh, in front of his place was the old Soap Lake Fountain, where people would come and fill bottles with Soap Lake water. Yeah. And uh, then beyond that was, um, uh, let me think, Marina Romery, well, at that time it was Mar Marina. No Terrace. No Terrace. They had like a little restaurant and we used to go in there and play pool when we were kids. And then you've passed Roxy Thorson's place. Oh, rock. uh, Roxy Thorson's yeah. rock place and, and uh, evaporation ponds were, were there. And then, and then No Terrace's place? Yes. Okay. There was a, further as you started up the hill. And at the top of the hill, then there wasn't too much from there to the top of the hill. There was, if anything, and then we ran into Pat Pat O'Brien's place, which would have been in that area. And that's where the the dog grooming uh, Happy Tails is now. Mm -hmm. You can see it in that one picture. It has O'Brien's yeah. to the right. But it shows this end of it rather than it shows the west that's end of that nice building end. rather than the east right. end of the oh. building. Yeah, it's this picture right here, Julia. Oh yes, I see that. Lawyer's office in there shows. <laughs> Gimple. 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 No, Gimple's place was further over by, by near the post office. It's says Edison on there though. I think he moved. Did he move? Yeah. But you sure see the, the age of these cars. <laughs> yeah, at this point they had changed the name from Sunset Theater to Lake Theater. Olson's Five and Dime. Did you ever visit my folks market? Oh, all the time. Because <laughs> uh, the next market was downtown, so if we wanted something, we would shoot over to Lanigan's and... Oh, yeah. Was there a school in town? Three-room school. Where was that? It's where the uh, city hall sits now. Uh, by the fire hall there. Yeah. Was that street there then? Oh, that, yes. That street that goes in front of the city hall now was there? Yeah, it was there. Was it dirt? Probably gravel. And, and the school was right there where the city hall is? Yes. On a, okay. Right a, among the rocks. We used to play tackle football on there, on the rocks. If we had a pair of shoulder pads, man, we were with it. <laughs> Who was your favorite teacher? Actually, all three teachers were my favorites. Miss Dick, Miss Cuddy Back, and Miss McCamey. You were in trouble all the time with Miss Dick. I can remember one time, May 1st, it was, uh, we were going to have a, a 
we went out to collect wildflowers for May 1st, May Day, and then we were supposed to come back to the school for a party. Well, Charlie Nichols and I decided we weren't coming back, so we took off and Miss Dick came looking for us, dragged us by the scruff of the neck back to school, laid us across her lap, individually of course, although she was big enough where both of us could have done. <laughs> And started wailing on us with her paddle. The paddle was about that thick and about that long. And I can still hear Charlie Nichols yelling, My dad's on the school board. <laughs> He's going to get you fired. <laughs> and I'll bet you, just like me, he didn't tell his dad when he got home. What dad <laughs> Who were your other classmates? Paul Clausen, George Waltho, Paul Hampton, Leo Hanley. Paul Robertson, Les Morton was one of the school, he was a year or so ahead of us. Sounds like an old boys school. I can't remember the girls. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't play tackle football. No. The girls didn't play. Art Thompson was another kid and his brother Ralph. You didn't you didn't fool around with Ralph too much. Our art would take a, take a, his brother would take you on. Ralph was uh, somewhat retarded, but he was a good kid. But because he was retarded, the other kids would would tease him and make fun of him, and Art would take retribution. How many grades? Oh, eight. Eight grade, and then and then what happened? Then we came to Ephrata. Okay. Rode the school bus for four years. How did that go over so far kids to the Ephraim schools? Actually, it went out well. As a matter of fact, uh, two thirds of the basketball and baseball and football teams were kids from Soap Lake. George Waltho, uh, Billy Ness, Paul Robertson. I played a little bit of, did a lot of bench time. <laughs> but, uh, we were not treated any differently coming from Soap Lake than the ones from Ephrata. After high school, what did you do? After high school? Yeah. Well, I graduated in May of 1944, and in July I was at the University of Washington for a year and went into the service. And then the United States Navy came back in, in late 46. To Soap Lake? Yes, well, to so play, but I actually had to get my grades back up. So I went to Central Washington College of Education at the time to get my grades back up, and then I went back to the University of Washington. Okay. Did you swim in the lake much? That's where I learned to swim. I used to wear these old woolen bathing suits that chafed the hell out of me. <laughs> We called it the Soap Lake Walk. <laughs> we all have it. Yeah. We're little. We all have it. That was before spandex and. But the, oh yeah, we used to swim a lot. Who rented out the swimsuits down oh. at that that place? Joe Elliott, the Joe Elliott's place on the beach. So it would have been Joe. You could rent rent most anything there. Would you talk about the dancing? It was such a big form of entertainment? Maybe talk about the places you like to go to dance and who, anybody you remember from those days, the proprietors? Well, actually, the only place that we actually danced was at the Bob White Tavern. Uh, well, I, we did go to that dance hall that was on the, that was in one of these pictures. Every Saturday night they had a dance there. Was that the McDonald building, or? I don't remember if it had a name, only just called it the dance hall. Uh, where was it in town? Describe the location. Right there near the hotel, out on the point. Oh, further down, towards the lake. No, actually right straight down. Oh. If the hotel was sitting this way and the street was here, you just went right straight down, there was the dance hall there. That's right there. In the right here. Oh, would you hand me that, Chuck? Right there. Can you see those papers? 
towards right here, right here, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah towards the lake. I, I see that. Hall. Yeah. Okay. That's Ultimately, it burned down. Do you remember what the name of it was? No. Dance hall. Just the dance hall. <laughs> okay. Uh, so the Bob White was uh, pretty, pretty big then. Have had a dance floor yeah. in. Oh yeah. Talk yeah. about the businesses, okay, so the street the, that Lewis Hotel was on, going down back out towards the, po the, the post office, today's post office. Oh, okay, on the corner, well, it was the theater, and on the corner was, uh, his last name was Faye. In the brick building? In that brick building on the corner was the, was the uh, he was a masseur also. And then across the street was... Uh, Lanigan's Grocery Market. Was there a place on the corner that it was an old hotel that had... Before, oh, that, was, that was in the back street. Yeah, well, no, there was one on the corner there. And I was wondering if you remember that or if you remember the foundation of that. Well, we used to play in the foundation. Across from my folks' house. Yes. Yeah. Yes. There was also one there in the parking lot there. In fact, it was quite modern in those days with a swimming pool. That's the, the McDonald's building. Uh, that must be... Uh, I'm not sure what the name was. There's that old hotel there, huh? One block back, off a. Of, it's it's uh, what's his name has that. So you're so keep going though. You got the 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 Lanigans grocery store, and then uh, I can't remember what was the next building, but then there was a garage. Well, before the garage, didn't Pete Benville Jr. live there, or ben, Mrs. Benville? Or I'm was not that sure lady? where they lived. Tell okay. you the truth, Linda. Okay. But then there was a garage that, uh, I want to say Larry Casciati, but does that make sense? Could be Dewey Johnson owned it later. Dewey Johnson, he owned it later. Yes. He's the one that put two cars together front and back. I don't know if you remember that or not. I heard So it was going down the street, it looked like it was, it was going back the other way. But that was Casciati's garage when yes. he was growing up. And, uh, Somehow there, there's a... Uh, <laughs> 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 it knows of all kinds of things that were going on. And across the street was Maxine, but I can't think of her last name. She was a classmate. Uh, and, then, and then further on down would have been Houghton's Lumberyard on the corner. That's where West Haven... Uh, second, uh, the building is called West Haven. Yes, the yeah, second-hand was, store now. That was Houghton's Lumberyard. And then later Frankie Carrison's Lumberyard, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, and that's where we used to wait to catch the bus to school in the morning. Mr. Houghton would get up early and start a fire in the pot belly stove, so at least it would be warm while we were waiting for the bus. Can I ask about um, the street behind it where my folks lived on First or Ash? Um, John... Nordstrom had a boarding house there mm -hmm. and still exists that building. Do you remember John Nordstrom? Yes. Do you remember anything about that how that building? I, I I know that it was there and I know I knew the Nordstrom family. But that's about it. Was it a full time rental, like a monthly rental versus tourist? I think a little of both, if I'm not mistaken. Sorry, I can't give you much more of a definitive answer. Can you identify the brick building on the other side of the theater? Right That's, on the that was that was the Mr. Fay. And what did he do? He was a masseur. A masseur. It wasn't a bank or anything. No, like that. no. No. We didn't Thank have you. a bank in town. The only bank we had was here in Ephrata, where the. Uh, uh, Wilson Creek State Bank is what they called it, and that's where the uh, beauty parlor is on the corner, across okay. from the parking lot. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Roy yeah. Mundy's old that real estate office. That was, that was, old real estate office. That was, a was bank. the Wilson Creek State Bank. Well, right behind that phase, I was, thought, was once told that the whole city hall was there. That where right, was that? City hall, right behind that brick building on the corner. Next to the theater. On the I don't remember that being the city hall. There was a building there. There's Behind that building, on the alley, though, was the lo local electric company owned by Hannafin. 
Did your folks ever go to the uh, Soap Lake Depot out in Grand Orchards and pick up? Every day. Every day. I was just explaining to Chuck that was kind of a who got there first type thing where you parked your car so that you could snag these people when they were getting off the train at Grand Orchards. Quite a competition. Oh yes. Well, George yeah. Walthall's father was there and I imagine several others that I can't remember at this point but I know that dad every day we would be out there picking up people off the train and bringing them into town and also at the bus station which happened to be the James Cafe. So did your hotel have a doctor there, you know, as part of the sanitarium, or what kind of services were offered there? Well, actually, mostly uh, hot soap lake baths and massage. I guess we had somebody there, but I can't think or I can't remember the name. A medical doctor there? No, no, he was not a medical doctor. The only medical doctor in town was Dr. Robertson, Paul Robertson's father. So most of the sanitariums um, had a masseuse mm -hmm. or something, somebody yeah. like that, and yeah. they're what they called them sanitariums then, but they're what we consider spas now. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. I think there was an era before even Julian's era where there was MDs or doctors uh, at a lot of. Uh, there was a lot more sanitariums back then too. That would have been even before your grandfather. 19, well, not too much before, but... More than likely. 1906 to maybe 19. He, he built that in 1919. Yes. Yeah, so it would have still been his ear, ear I suspect. There was... So do you know, uh, were there... You said there was just Dr. Robertson was the only MD? That's the only one that I can remember at the time. Okay. I, I love to hear about all the, the number of people in town, and you've already described it a little bit about how close they were, but... Talk to me a little bit more about the numbers of people, how close, I mean, literally just paint that picture as clear as you can about the numbers of people on the streets of Soap Lake and, and roughly what year. So start out by saying in 19 whatever year you can maybe generally, you know, describe as much detail as you can. Are you talking about summer months? Yes. Well, of course, it would start right around uh, Memorial Day it was the start of the uh, tourist season. And people would come to Soap Lake for anywhere from a week to two weeks to a month, some of them with some type of affliction or some of them with just the, the need to get away from Seattle, Spokane, whatever, soak up the sun and swim and so on. And I think I alluded to the fact that on a Saturday night, you could not walk shoulder to shoulder down the street. There were so many people coming and going. Is that just on the sidewalk or is that most, Mostly on the sidewalk as you uh -huh. go downtown, down the hill. So if the sidewalk was full, you kind of stepped out into the street? Mm -hmm. More than likely, or get trampled. <laughs> How about burgers, Julian? Burgers yeah. disease. Well, in 1938, was it 38? Uh, I'm not sure exactly the year, but it would, but it would have been close to 38. No, 1940 is when they opened up McKay Hospital for burgers patients. Burger's disease was a disease that caused the uh, circulation in the extremities to die out. And in order to keep the person alive, they had to amputate to keep ahead of it. And the, the uh, hospital was built as a burger patient hospital. And it was uh, dedicated with Governor Martin. And the reason I remember that is because I was in a Boy Scout troop and we were there as part of the dedication would have been like 39 or 40 thereabouts. And as the burger patients began to die off, there was not the need for that kind of a facility. And uh, ultimately was taken over by the uh, army as a, as a field hospital as part of the air base com uh, complex here in Ephrata and at Moses Lake. And then it went back, after the war was over, it went, went back to a hospital district and became a regular acute care facility. Did you see uh, ever any of those Burgers patients through town? Did you have any friends who had Burgers disease? Oh, yes. Talk, oh, talk yes. a little bit about that. Well, they were all World War I veterans, pretty much so, and that's where they, they thought Burgers disease was uh, something that they picked up in the trenches in France and during the war. 
the one that, I, that uh, I remember specifically was Sam Gorman and his wife Florence. He had both legs amputated and I think several fingers. But they were uh, a good group. They were there because they had to be there in order to check this disease. It didn't cure it, but the water checked it. It was the only water that they, or the only way that they knew how to stop the disease from progressing. And there were others uh, that we knew from. Uh, there was a one one man from New York by the name of uh, Bastido, who used to come out every summer. He was a burger patient, but he would stay with us at the hotel and uh, take the hot soap lake baths and it made him feel better. But he was a, an ex-police officer from New York City. <clears throat> Did they ever use the mud? Not so much the, the burger patients, but the people, the tourists from Seattle, they loved the mud. <laughs> he used to fly over and see them while they're all bathing with the mud. And Do you remember the Indians? Every, every summer they would come pitch their, their teepees on the East Beach and we would, as kids, we would let them ride our bicycles if, we would let the, if they would let us ride their horses. <laughs> so that's we always look forward to seeing them. Was there horse races at that time? Indian horse races? I imagine so, but I don't know exactly where. And in your hotel, did you have a room with tubs in it, or did you have separate rooms? Were there tubs no, in no, separate rooms? No, no, just a room with tubs. How many tubs did you have? Three. Were they set? Were there separate rooms for men and women, or? Well, they were in their own little cubicle. Okay. Do you remember the nudist colony? Oh boy, do I! <laughs> <laughs> Oh boy, do I. <laughs> I'm not sure I want to say. <laughs> so, so you're telling us that you did hike the West Hills. Oh, yeah. Oh, even better than that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Julian, this is your chance. <laughs> What's the story? <laughs> At what age were you? Sylvia probably knows oh, the story. Been, uh, He'll tell you. 13, 14. Ah, you collect the mud. Well, that was a, that was another story. Yeah. Oh, so tell us about both stories. <laughs> well, we were as kids, we would uh, dive and bring up the mud and put them in a bucket and sell it for twenty five cents a bucket. These folks that loved the mud, who didn't know how to get it, well, that's how we used to make a little spending money. It would be the the green goopy stuff off the East Beach primarily. Uh, as far as the nudist colony is concerned, there were people who were, how would I say it, would come there just because of the nudist colony, and so some of us would rent a, a rowboat and drift, drift, drift by the nudist colony with binoculars. <laughs> That's a normal thing for guys. Sure. Thirteen-year-olds. Yeah, especially. Yeah. Curiosity. Yes. You know what it did to the cat. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so with the nudist colony, would you kind of describe where where it was then? Well, actually, there was there was two separate ones: one for the women and one for the men. The women's part had like little rock half circles for each person so that they could not be seen from the road that went on to the men's nudist colony. Now the men were not quite as prudish. They would walk around nude. <laughs> <laughs> and now the road you're talking about, was that the road that's now kind of blocked at Sam Israel's land there at the edge of town? And the it road? didn't go quite that far. It was primarily where those houses are on the west side of the lake. So the nudist colony was where those houses are now? Yes. On the northwest kind of corner and right there going a little... Well, there was a, the, a man by the name of Carl Bushman lived in that area. Uh, so there would have been a residential uh, facility. And incidentally, not to digress, but but Carl was a guard at one of the concentration camps in Germany at the time. And he somehow or other wound up in Soap Lake. 
and he and my father used to discuss this a lot. The Carl uh, was quite a drinker, and I think it was because of the of his past. But he lived in that area, and so that might be what you're talking about. Was he, how how long did he live there? Was he a piano player? Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. he lived there up until Carl. about five years ago, ten, eight years ago, I think. Yes, he ultimately passed away. He was a good piano player. Excellent. In fact, he used to accompany my dad when my dad would play the violin. Mm -hmm. Do you remember uh, construction of the road along Soap Lake and also Grand Coulee Dam? Oh, yes. Dad, uh, when the, during the construction of the dam, used to take some of the residents of the hotel on a tour up to the dam, and I used to go every once in a while. And uh, you're talking about the, the million mile, million dollar. No, road. actually, the the road that Highway 17. Oh, yeah, so so Lake, Lake, on the Lake. east side of the lake. Oh yes, that was that road was there when we came. Okay. Was it paved? Oh yes. What about that um, contraption that's in front of the park before the park was there? That in that picture you gave me, it's all those black things at the end of the lake that's in the water. Do you know what that is? Or? Uh, do you, it, it was an engineering thing to do with um, water levels. Do you know anything about? Do you remember the story of the wa Soap Lake water getting really high and flooding some yeah. of the basements? Mm -hmm. Uh, and then they had to build a pump station. Can you talk about that? The pump station is on Road 20, where they pumped water out of the lake. No, actually, they had what they called interception wells. They drilled some severe reclamation because the lake was rising with water that was seeping in due to the blasting of the, of the rocks to build the irrigation system. They dug some what they called interception wells, and they would pump water from there up into the canal so that it didn't go back into the lake and flood it. I think that's what you were talking about. Yeah, there's, we'll have to get that picture, Bridget, and well, have it. What I can tell, this thing that was in the water, it was the north end corner of the lake, the very northeastern corner of the lake, right where Patio Park is now, or where the RV Park is now. Mm -hmm. But it was in the water right next to the road, it's and there. it's all black and wires and do you remember when that was there? It was had been there like in the very late forties or into maybe the middle fifties. I wonder if it could have been some kind of a pump. For, just for the soap lake siphon. I'm not really sure. I, I think I know what you're talking about, but well now at the at the north end of the lake there was also some interception wells that were that were drilled to keep water from running into the lake and they pumped it up into the Lenore Lake. There was a canal that was built from the north end of the Soap Lake clear over to the Lenore Lake and they would pump the water from these interception wells into this canal and they would dump it into the Lenore Lake, which I think made it ultimately go fresh. That canal is still there. Is the canal there? Mm -hmm. Yes. Do you remember hearing any, to change the subject a little bit, do you remember hearing any stories about Horse Thief Cave or oh, yes. anything that went on out there? <laughs> <laughs> I can remember as a Boy Scout we were doing some, as one of the uh, requirements for one of the badges, we were doing some cooking in the outdoors. We were going to cook eggs and bacon and so forth and my job was to go collect snow so that I could melt it down and make uh, hot chocolate. And they kept finding little lumps in it. Right. Turned out it was rabbit poop. Oh my goodness. They never lived that down. <laughs> <laughs> they never put me on that detail. <laughs> but that horse thief cave was quite a quite an, uh, an oddity at the time. And I, I, when I worked for the bureau uh, on survey, uh, we ran into all kinds of snakes mostly rattlers, and in the spring, when they would go, come back to start working again, they would be blasting, and this big ball of snakes would be come out of the ground. Rattlesnakes and bull snakes all wrapped up together, you know, ordinarily they're mortal enemies. But at least, I get so excited when I saw a snake, I thought, well, the next snake that I kill, I'm going to make a belt buckle out or a belt out of it. But I get so excited to chop them up that it wasn't enough to make a watch band. <laughs>
<laughs> but I had a whole jar of rattles yes. that we got when I was working out there. <laughs> did many people live in the West Lawn Acres area, or did you hike out there as a kid? No, that, was, that didn't even exist until later on. <laughs> Who are some of the really memorable characters? I mean, if you look back over the last seven decades or something, I mean, some so people, Blake. yeah, so Blake. People spring to mind. I guess the one that comes to mind mostly is George Walthall's mother, Maggie. Why is that? She was really quite a character. She was the mayor of, of Soap Lake for a time. Typical Irishman, Irish person. If she loved you, she loved you. If she hated you, look out. <laughs> Where did you fall in that category? <laughs> well, because I was George's friend, she liked me. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about the kind of mayor she was in that whole story with the, if you recall any aspects of that story when she took the sheriff's, or the uh, police chief's uh, gun. Well, I'm not sure exactly what act, what happened because that was probably, uh, at, my, at, that, at that age, I didn't really pay too much attention, but she ruled the town with an iron fist. If you wanted anything done, you went to Maggie. And I'm getting back to your question, apparently the town marshal didn't acquiesce to what she wanted him to do, and so she, she went and said, I want your gun and your badge, and he said no, and I think she took it by force. <laughs> she was a big She's person. A big woman. Big person. Before she, Marina, there was Maggie. <laughs> <laughs> but she and her husband both, Mr. Walther, were, were registered nurses at one time, and uh, came to Soap Lake and opened up a sanitarium. Did you ever camp down by the lake when George got kicked out of his bedroom so his folks could rent his bedroom out? No, but I slept, I think I slept in every room in the hotel at one time or another. <laughs> 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 Thank you. I can remember sleeping in a, on a mattress on the back porch because they, they rented my room <laughs> to someone. Can you tell us about your brother and sister in Silk Lake and, and life with them or any memorable thoughts about them? Growing up? Well, we all grew up together. We all had our, our responsibilities at the hotel. And as I said earlier, we were dishwashers, waiters, cooks, garbage men, mowed the lawn, made we the did beds. everything, made the beds, chambermaid work. We were all, it was a family operation. And your mother is still alive? She's still alive to this, this day. She's 102. Oh. Sharp as a tack. Mm -hmm. You don't dare argue poli mm -hmm. politics or religion with her, because you'll lose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Does she live here? No, she lives in Seattle in a nursing home. Well, all of the kids are there, see, the grandkids. And, uh, uh, let's see. You said my sister lives there. Sister. Yeah. What brought Sylvia into this picture? Oh, gee. <laughs> well, I was home, I was home from college one summer, summer of 47, I believe, mm -hmm. and I was a soda jerk at the hotel, and my brother was going around with her sister. She was, had come to Soap Lake with her parents. For the water. For the water and the sun, and uh, my brother introduced her to me, and I had a beard just like I have now, pretty much so and she could hardly wait to get out of town. Not because of me, but... <laughs> Coming from Seattle to Soap Lake, it's quite a shocker. That's what they say. <laughs> <laughs> so she uh, said she was going back to Seattle, and I said, well, I'll take you to the railroad station, which would, would have been in Ephrata. And... Uh, How old were you guys at this time? I would have been probably 19, 20. And I uh, said, I'm coming back to the university. Can I, can I see you? And she said, well, I'll think about it. <laughs> and 61 years later, here we are. Yes. Uh, 61 years. <laughs> um, I can remember um, a woman telling me stories about 30 years ago, and she was 90 years old at the time, about bringing busloads of people down from Spokane. This was 
Stoke Lake was their place to party, and they would bring buses in. Do you remember buses coming in, busloads of people coming in? No, I don't remember. I remember the Dukabors coming down from Canada. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What is that one? That's a Russian sect who used to take off all their clothes in March. They never did it in Soap Lake, but, but they did it in, in Canada. But they would come down, and my dad was in seventh heaven because he still spoke fluent Russian at the time. Matter of fact, he had seven or eight different languages that he spoke. But he would uh, meet with the Dukabors who would come into the hotel, and they would rattle off in Russian by the hour. And it made him feel good because he didn't actually have anyone else to converse with. My folks always talk so highly of your parents. And um, I love your mother, and I remember your father. And um, I remember them always bragging about your father's ability with the music. His oh, music, the violin. His violin. And, and of course, my dad just had one lesson, was just a fiddler. But he had a lot of respect for your father. Did your father own a Stradivarius? Yes. He did. Yes, and so he had this education, this music ed education at, in his home country. And then he continued in Seattle. Yes, actually, he never. He, he went from grade school into high school, graduated from Franklin High School in Seattle. And because of his music background, went to work for Professor Morris Rosen at the University of Washington, teaching violin. And uh, ultimately wound up, when we moved from Chicago to San Diego when I was four years old, he went to work. Uh, teaching music with the Alfred Arts Academy, which was in the area. It's kind of interesting, during the, during the Prohibition in, in Chicago, he had a number of gangsters' children as pupils, and they watched over him because they, re they recognized his abilities and the fact that he was a good teacher. And uh, if anybody got tough with my dad, they better look out. They wound up with broken knees. So did your dad play music at the hotel? All the time. That was his first love, was, was his music. Was he ever tempted to pack up and head back to Los Angeles? I mean, did he... Oh, I think maybe he did, but he, had, he understood that he had obligations there in Soap Lake, and that, that kind of put the kibosh on it. <laughs> 